tonight, I can tell you, when I was 18, 17 and 18, I hear these stories about guys jumping on trains, like here in Dallas, getting off in St. Louis, and of course not buying a ticket, and uh, walking around St. Louis for a couple days, then getting me back on the train and going to Chicago and walking around Chicago. And when they got ready to come home, they get another train and come back. And you camped out in parks and things like that at night sometimes. And that sounded for a 17 year old a lot of fun. So I have to say, I had the idea of what he had tonight, what he's gonna talk about tonight, but I didn't have the guts. <laughs> because I started hearing stories about people getting thrown off the train uh, in the middle of nowhere because they didn't have a ticket and the, the train folks didn't care how you got home. So you couldn't just jump back on the next train and go back. So when I started hearing those stories, I started having, uh, say, reservations. But nevertheless, our speaker tonight, Rick Frey, uh, is gonna talk about his six weeks on the throne Obviously, he hid in the bathroom part of that time to accomplish. Rick, it's, it's an honor to have you. Come on up. And um, he's got a wonderful slideshow to tell you. Uh, and by the way, I hope you didn't bring a passport because you don't need one. Yeah, I'm coming back for that camel show. I want to hear about that. <laughs> Um, good evening. Hope you all are well. Um, I put this slide up. I don't know if you've ever been to presentations and you wonder where, where's this guy from? Um, I'm from California, but not the part of California you, you probably imagine. You usually think of the beaches, San Francisco, the crowded freeways, all of that. I live way over on the east side of California, close to the Nevada border. Um, it's a different part of California, and there's lots of places like this in California that uh, few people know about. This is a picture I took just north of where I live. Uh, those are the Sierra Nevada mountains. Uh, the little town of Bishop is just to the south of this picture, uh, nestled up against, against those mountains. But we're here today to talk about this. Last week, I, does anybody here have Alexa? You know what it is, right? You, you, you can talk to Alexa. I said, Alexa, tell me a library joke. And she, there was a pause, and then she said, why are libraries so tall? She doesn't give you much time. And then she says, because they have so many stories. <laughs> well, I want to tell you about a story. This is, this is a tale. It's a true story about a 19-year-old California surfer who had a dream to go to, to Hawaii and surf for the entire summer. This kid had worked his whole life in the summertime. And by the time he got to be 19, he said, that's it, I'm gonna enjoy a summer. Before we get into this, this uh, adventure, and what, what I should point out, first of all, is that, so he saved for it, and then he got there, and then eight days after he arrived, he left. Now, why would a person do that? To give you some motivation about this and tell you a little background, I want to mention four events that occurred. Number one, one year before this occurred, in this was in the summer of 1966. In 1977, or 75, his best friend's aunt and uncle who lived in England came to visit his family in Los Angeles in the summer of 65. And that summer I got to know them. I really liked them, and I think the feeling was mutual because when they left to go back to England, Irene, the, the, the mom, said, um, Ricky, if you ever come to England, we hope that you'll stay with us. And I said, yes, ma'am. If I ever get there, I will do that. Six months before this summer, 
my friend Dick Weishart got a job with the Honolulu YMCA working at the Y. And he said, Rick, if you can figure out a way to get to Hawaii, I'll have a really cheap room waiting for you. I said, well, how cheap, Dick? He said, 10 bucks a week. And I said, what if I had a roommate? And he said, five bucks a week. So I figured it out. I said, well, 70 cents a day? Yeah, that sounds good. Three months before this, I was required to take a water safety instructor course at the university as part of my, back, my uh, major, which was kinesiology. It used to be called physical education back in those days. And the course was taught by a professor from uh, Australia named Barry Devine. Barry had worked for the Australian Lifeguard Service, and they had had a number of fatalities off the coast of Australia mostly caused by small craft that had capsized or had hit something and sunk immediately. So the people on board the, the boats had no flotation device, and they were often too far offshore to swim in. And the Lifeguard Association developed a program called drown proofing. And basically what drown proofing is, it's the ability to help a person that's in the water, usually fully clothed and struggling, to relax and to give rescuers time to get to them. What the technique involves is not trying to fight the current, not trying to fight against the waves, but to take a deep breath and to just go underwater and relax. If the water's cold, fold up into a, um, a fetal position to preserve body heat and try to calm down. When you run out of air, come to the surface, take a good breath or two, and then go back under and relax. You'll see in a few minutes why that was an important lesson that I took that day in the university pool. Last event that occurred, occurred the day I left for the islands. I'm waiting in the kitchen for my ride, and my dad comes in. And he says, big day, huh? And I said, yes, sir. He says, how long do you plan to stay over there? Three months, dad, the whole summer. Well, how much money do you have, son? Proudly, I said, $140. And he kind of looked at me and shook his head and said, well, how do you plan to spend three months in Hawaii for $140? And I said, well, first of all, I've got a great housing plan. And I'm going to eat cheaply. And also, if I run out of money, I'll get a part-time job in the evening so I can still surf during the day. And he just started laughing. He said, son, the money is going to run out. There won't be any jobs because every kid from the mainland's over there. I predict you'll be home in two weeks. Hawaii won't be like it is here in the nest, you know. Now, can any of you remember back when you were a teenager and maybe you had some wild plan? And then you're smarter an older parent told you what a dumb idea it was? Do you remember how you felt? I'll tell you how I felt. I was angry. But I wasn't going to show that to my dad. No way. I just nodded and said, as I went out the door, I'll see you in late September, Dad. And I vowed there was no way under any circumstances I was going back home until late, November, or late September. Oops, sorry. Mark Twain said that you only need two things to be successful, ignorance and confidence. There is the photograph of success. <laughs> this kid didn't know anything about the world, but he did think he was bulletproof. He didn't think anything could, could phase him. Uh, he's just about ready to find out. 
true to his word, the gentleman in the red shorts sitting in the background, Dick Weishart, did get us that room. And the gentleman in the front, Jamie Kogut, was a friend of mine from the University Rugby Club. And Jamie agreed to split the cost with me in the room, so we had it made. And we lived quite frugally, and we still had a whole lot of fun. However, eight days later, you, can you see a look on that guy's face? Like, you know what? The old man might be right. I had 70 bucks left. Half of it was gone after eight days. I knew I'd have to go find a job. And so the very next day, I went out and scoured the businesses in Honolulu. I spent $4 of my 70 on cab fare and buses and newspapers looking in classified ads, and I went all over that town and finally landed a 30-day job with the Dole Pineapple Company, picking pineapples on the island of Lanai. I just had to show up Monday morning and get a physical, and then I'd be on an airplane that afternoon. While I was looking for work, this ship came into port the SS Iberia. She was with the Peninsular and Oriental Steam Navigation Company, also called P&O Lines. If any of you have ever cruised or cruised back in the day, you may have heard of the P&O Lines. I would never have known this ship even came into port, except for one interesting coincidence. Dick Weishart, the fellow who had the job at the YMCA, his girlfriend back in Los Angeles, his girlfriend's grandparents were on this ship. Um, the grand, her grandparents knew Dick, and they had contacted him, or Nancy, his girlfriend, contacted Dick and said, hey, they're coming into port tomorrow. They want you to come aboard for dinner. And Dick said, well, I got Rick and Jamie with me. She said, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to him, or, or bring him, or whatever. But anyway, we got invited. You see these uh, big, big windows right here? This is the bridge up here. But you see these big windows across there? This is what it looks like behind those windows. This is the first class observation lounge. This is where we met the grandparents about 5 o'clock, 5.30 that afternoon. We sat down, had gin and tonic, 19-year-old drinking gin and tonic. It was cool. And then we took our drinks, and we went to the first-class dining saloon, and we had dinner. And it was a beautiful room. The, the stewards were elegantly dressed and perfect uniforms, the food was outstanding, huge menu, the whole thing, as you might imagine, in first class. And when dinner was over, Dick offered to take the grandparents downtown Honolulu to see the sights. The ship was sailing at midnight. And they, they gave us the option to stay on board and explore the ship a little bit until Dick came back, so we agreed we'd do that. And so they left. And Dick, Jamie and I were sitting at the table finishing off the, about half a bottle of wine that was still there. And uh, I said, you know, we ought to buy another bottle, fall asleep in one of those deck chairs, and wake up tomorrow, and we'll be far out at sea. And the steward who was picking up the tableware overheard us and said, well, that would be a lot of fun, wouldn't it? And I said, yeah. Uh, tell me, is there any penalty? What would the penalty be if you f fell asleep and they found you when you were on board? And he took the tray of silverware and dishes, and he turned as he looked over his shoulder. He said, no penalty, mate, if you don't get caught. <laughs> 20 minutes later, we were outside the dining saloon meeting and talking with David McLean, a 21-year-old Irishman who'd been around the world several times on ships. And he told us that Iberia was heading for Japan. Then Hong Kong, Singapore, 
over to India through the Red Sea and up the, um, up the Suez Canal, across the Mediterranean, eventually going to Southampton, England. Now, what do we know about England that I mentioned before? Hey, I got people in England I know. David said, there's plenty of food on board. All you got to do is find a place to sleep. And that shouldn't be difficult. There's so many different places on a ship. He reached in his wallet, in his pocket, pulled out his wallet, and took a piece of paper out and handed it to me. It was his crew identification. He said, you'll probably need to go get some clothes if you decide to, to come back. And you can use this to get back aboard. And I said, well, what if I don't come? He says, no worries. I'll, I'll just get another one, say I lost it. And then he started walking towards the hatchway, and he looked over his shoulder again in that way. He did. And he said, trip of a lifetime, Ricky. And then he stepped through the hatchway and started walking up the deck. Well, I was petrified with fear and excitement. And I looked over at Jamie, and Jamie's just got his mouth open like, you're not thinking about this, are you? And I dashed out after David, and I called to him, and he turned around. He was up, up the, the deck a little bit. He, he, he stopped and looked around, and I said, if you were me, David, would you go for it? And he walked back towards me. He got about a body length away, put his hands on his hips. He looked up in the sky, and he said, hmm, the trip of a lifetime. And then he looked me right in the eye, and he said, absolutely. And then he winked at me, and then he turned and left. Now I was hooked. This guy was my hero already. He's already been around the world. He's two years older. He's Irish, his, his accent's so cool. And he just gave me his crew pass. Well, I won't go into the, the conversation that Jamie and I had for the next 45 minutes to an hour on that ship. I will just tell you this, Jamie was trying to convince me it was a stupid idea. And I was trying to agree with him, but I kept thinking about David, and I kept thinking about picking pineapples, and I kept thinking about how that was going to ruin my vacation. And I kept thinking that maybe I could do that and not actually get caught and get to England. And the Barlows, Ken and Irene Barlow, the English um, aunt and uncle of my friend Steve, that they'd take care of me and they'd help me find a way to earn the money to get home to the States. We went out to hitchhike to go back to the YMCA. Jamie was desperate to get me back to the YMCA. He figured if he could get me off that ship, then reason would sink in. We stuck our thumbs out to hitchhike, hitchhike hike back to the Y and a taxi stopped. And when we told the driver, sir, we, we don't have the money to pay for a cab ride. He said, oh, I'm going right by the YMCA, hop in, no charge. And, and Jamie and I got in the back seat and looked at each other. I mean, neither one of us had ever heard of a cab driver giving up a free ride before. And I whispered to, to, to Jamie, this must be a sign. I'm looking for any good reason, right? So we get back. I decide I'm at least going to go back and see the ship again. I put on several layers of clothes. I pack my billfold in my sea bag, and I give it to Jamie, because Jamie's only got a one-way ticket. I've got a round trip. I give him my round trip ticket. I say, will you take my stuff back if I decide to go for it? And he said, yeah, of course. I wrote a quick note to my folks, found a great opportunity to see the world. I'll be careful. More later, Rick. Right? I said, if, when you see my folks, give them this because they're going to want to know why you're showing up with my surfboard and my, suit, my sea bag and my suitcase. He goes, yeah. And I said, and you can give them the $80 that you'll owe me. He said, okay, we'll do. So, but we, there's still 90 minutes before the ship sails. There's no guarantee we're going to make it back in time. And we're several miles from the piers. But we, I stick my thumb out, and the first car that comes by stops and picks us up. 
And the guy says, where are you going? He said, well, we're trying to get down to the piers. And he said, ah, oh, it's your lucky night. That's where I'm going. Oh, what's going on? Well, I work for a shipping company, and we're, I'm going down to the piers to see my ship off. Oh, what's the ship's name? Oh, she's called Iberia. Jamie and I look at each other again. What's going on here? So we're there 30 minutes before sailing time. He and I are going at it again, talking about the pros and cons of doing it. And finally, I just say, I'm going to go see if I'm just going to go see if I can get back on board. He goes, OK. This is the Aloha Tower. Anybody been to Hawaii and seen this? You know this tower? Yeah. Um, the ship was tied up just on the other side of these uh, green roofed buildings. When that clock hand reached midnight, the ship cast off its lines and sailed away. And I was on board. One hour after sailing time, according to the directions that David McLean had said to me, meet me up on the forecastle at 1 AM. It should be quiet up there after, after we sail. I'll have a cold beer for you, mate. OK. So I eventually made my way up on the forecastle. The forecastle's uh, short for forecastle, or the bow, you know, the bow of the ship, this whole area right here. So I met him up there. I walked up there. And who's standing there? David McLean. And he's got two cold cans of beer in his hand. And he says, good on you. I knew you'd do it. I said, well, how did you know? Just knew. He gave me two good pieces of advice while I was up there that first hour. One, with 1,800 passengers and crew on board, you're going to be observed almost all of the time. You have to look like you belong. And with a flourish, she said, pretend you own the whole bloody ship. And two, you can't stay up in the first class. You have to go back into the stern area, the after section of the ship where tourist class passengers are because of your wardrobe and because of who you are. You're a kid. And most of the people up in first class are older people with money. You're going to have to blend in back there in tourist class, which raises a problem. I work in the first class dining saloon, so we're going to need one more crewman. Oh, I was really against this, because you know how secrets are. The more that know, the sooner it gets revealed. But a couple minutes later, this tall, lanky-haired guy with curly hair comes up on the forecastle. And he looks at David, and he says, well, what's the surprise? And he points at me. And he told him what my status was. Malcolm about fell over. He says, I'll have nothing to do with this. And, and then David said, well, then you're going to have to turn him in, because now you know. And he said, no, I wouldn't give the officers on this ship the time of day. Right then, you're with us, mate. And so Malcolm reluctantly agreed. He worked in the tourist class dining saloon. He said, well, I'm going to have to have one more. It's going to have to be a passenger who would agree to give, I would give him food, and then he could take food out of the dining room. And so we agreed that that would be it. If he could convince one of the passengers at his table, there was reserved seating in the dining rooms. If he could convince that passenger to, to aid and abet, if you will. The first night on board, they put me in this little, can you see this, this mast? See this compartment that it runs through? There's a doorway right here. Can you see it? In behind that doorway were old cables, chain, pulleys, etc. They gave me a blanket, and I wrapped up in it, and I spent the first night in there. And before dawn, I got up, 
and pretended to own the whole bloody ship and walked down out of the, off the forecastle, across the well deck, up to the passenger decks, walked all the way to the very stern of the ship that looks like this. Now this is tourist class. Those are some deck chairs that had been put out. Uh, I wasn't told one thing though by David. On my way to stern, um, I came to a door. It said tourist class passengers only. I went to open the door and it was locked. The door had a, a bulkhead or, uh, over it and around it that dead ended on the life rail. There was no way to get past the door unless you were willing to step out over the life rail, hold on to the life rail and sidestep around the doorway and then climb back over. And the cruise for me almost ended right there. It was so paralyzing to look over the uh, over the the railing and see the 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 water pounding and crashing along the hull of the ship as we went through the waves and to know that if you slipped you were going to get pulled alongside the hull and probably pass through the ship's screws and if you survived that you'd be out there and behind the ship watching it go over the horizon and nobody would miss you Nobody would miss me at all until noon was when I was supposed to meet Malcolm by the tourist class swimming pool. But I find the sun was starting to come up. I looked very conspicuous standing there. I had that blanket tucked under my arm. And so I just called on my ancestors and went for it. Went out there and walked around it and got back over. And I was so relieved that I made it. Came back to the stern here stretched out one of these deck chairs and just laid there, quiver, kind of quivering. That morning, after I regained my composure, I walked around and explored the ship a little bit. Uh, this is one of the interior rooms. Uh, it's the tourist lounge. I only show you this one because back here, there are some tables desks, I should say, that had stationery on them. And at that, that's where I started writing this book. I started taking notes on what, what had happened while I was there until I had this big pocket full of paper that I eventually needed to find a hiding place for. But there were a lot of places like this throughout the ship. This is um, called the Veranda Cafe. You can see the decor and what it was like. Here's an overview of what Iberia looked like uh, from the side. This is the, uh, that mast that we looked at. And this is where I spent the first night. All of this area of the fo forecastle, or what the crew would call the peak, is where the, the uh, non-Indian crew stayed. This area up here is first class. This area back here is tourist class. And there was a contingency, contingency of um, Indians from the state of Goa, Goanese, the Indian state of Goa, that were the deck crew. They wore blue, like work clothes, with a red cap. And they were the ones that put out the deck chairs and cleaned the decks and did the outside work. And the other folks were working uh, in the dining rooms and in the social areas, etc. Three days after we got underway, I went up on the bow. Oh, first of all, I met I met Malcolm at noon by the pool, and there was this sandy-haired fellow standing there with him, uh, leaning against the railing. And uh, when I walked up. <laughs> the, this, uh, Malcolm introduced me to Gordon, and I said, oh, wow, I don't want you to get in any trouble, Gordon, like that. And he, 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 in secret agent fashion, he says, lower your voice, mate. We don't want to get caught the first day. 
he was like playing James Bond more than me. He, was, he really liked doing this. And what would happen is he'd ask Malcolm if he could have a, a sandwich to, go, to take with him after all the other people at their table left. And then Malcolm would go and take some pieces of whatever they had for lunch and put it on some bread and then give it to Gordon. Gordon would wrap it up in his towel and leave it on a deck chair for me. That's how I was eating one meal a day. Uh, usually, and uh, I also found out that beer was uh, one shilling and one pence, about 15 or 16 cents. So for a beer and a sandwich every day, I was surviving. I need, did need a place to sleep, though, and I'll just tell you right off the bat, the first place that I came up with was the public restrooms. There were stalls. There were three sorry, two uh, heads, as Navy calls the restrooms, on each deck of F, E, and D, and for men and two for, for women. And there were several stalls, usually three, but on a couple of them there were only two stalls. I found out that if you, if you sat down and you put your elbow in the crook of the, of the handhold, and they had ashtrays that you could take the ashtray out and you could put your other arm in the ashtray holder and your elbow here and you could get a little bit of sleep while sitting on the john. Also, if you could lean back into the corner, you could rest your shoulder into the corner of one side or the other and put your head back. Or you could lean forward and just put your hands on your knees and put your head on your, on your arms, okay? But remember, this wasn't like a full night's sleep. I'd stay up as late as I could, like two o'clock. There were parties going on all the time. And then when everybody broke up from the parties and the bars and all that, I would go down to my bunk and sleep for a couple of hours. And then about five, 5.30, Start getting, starting to get light. I'd get, get up, wash my face, and go out and start the day again. And of course, if I was exhausted, which I was a lot of the time, I could always sleep in a deck chair. Or get a book and get in the library and fall asleep with a book on my chest. So I was feeling okay. I mean, this is happening. I'm not, I'm not injured, and I'm not picking pineapples. So far, so good. I wanted to tell you about this photo. I went up on the forecastle, um, and there was a, a crewman up there playing records on a portable record machine. And, you know, this is before, you know, this is 1966, so it was still record players, you know, no tapes or anything like that. Um, and I started visiting with him and found out his name was Ralph. He was from Somerset, England. He wanted to know about Hollywood, and he wanted to know about Disneyland and surfing, and we sort of struck up a friendship. He took this picture of me. I wanted you to see this because I want you to know about Ralph, because in a minute, Ralph's gonna come in very handy. Maybe a day or two after that, there was a tour of the bridge. Tourist class passengers could go up to the, up to the bridge and see what goes on up, up where the ship is controlled. So the social director took a group up there and I tagged along. And we went up to first class. This is the first class sports deck. Um, you see there's, there's courts laid out there. Where people play games called deck quoits or they play shuffleboard and things like that. We walked up and we went into the back, the back way to the bridge back in here that was for officers only. And we ended up up on the actual bridge. This is a picture I took while I was up on the bridge. Um, an interesting thing happened just before I took this picture. I was on the bridge feeling very nervous, proud, proud to be willing to go up there. Remember, I've got to try to look like I own the whole bloody ship, right? But still nervous because these are the guys that can bust you, right? And Next to the ship's microphone, um, their public address system, there was a chart on the wall 
uh, there was um, uh, some paragraphs, and I started reading it, and here's what it said. And before I tell you what it said, this is what I heard in Honolulu about a week earlier at 30 minutes before sailing time. All visitors ashore, all visitors ashore, all visitors and individuals not sailing on Iberia who are paying passengers are directed to depart the ship via the gangway in tourist class on C deck or the gangway on B deck in first class as the ship will be departing in 30 minutes. We must warn you any individual found on board after Iberia sails will be treated as a stowaway and dealt with accordingly. All visitors ashore. And as I read that, I started to faint. I mean, I actually started, my knees started to give out. And I had to grab onto the navigation table that was right near the mic. And I just willed myself, come on, come on, breathe, 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 breathe. My head down, I couldn't see. I mean, I was scared, real scared. And about that time, the first officer walked over, and on the table there were some parallel rulers. Anybody here ever navigate at sea? You, you, ever, see, you ever see parallel rulers? They go like this and you use it to lay out a course on a large chart. And he, he said, I think to me, because I was the one standing there, although I had my head down, do you know how these work? And I could barely understand him. And I kind of looked up and I just shook my head like that. And he goes, well, and then he starts laying out a course. And then a couple of other people came. And then I started breathing. And then I started coming back out of it. And I thanked the table. Really, I mean, I was kind of going like this, thank you, thank you, because I had something to hold on to. And uh, I could breathe, and I felt better, and I was standing there, and he finished talking about navigation and using the parallel rulers, and out of my dumb 19-year-old mouth, I said, what about this thing on the wall here? Oh, yeah, right, mate. We, um, we read that 30 minutes, 15 minutes, and five minutes before departure. Deter stowaways. Well, tell me, do you ever get any stowaways? Not often, not often. But when we do, we know what to do, do with them. Well, like, what do you do with them? Well, first we'll lock them up. Maybe we'll put them to work. We may drop them off at the next port and turn them over to the authorities. We may take them to a port where the authorities are really, really not very nice. And ultimately, because the stowaway is on a carrier of the Queen's mail, they'll be getting federal fines and time in jail. Wow, I said, wow, that's got to deter them. He goes, yeah, righto. And then he turned and walked out, and I followed him out and took that picture. And while I was taking that picture, I was thinking, oh, good Lord, what have you done? What have you done? What have you done? Nine days after leaving Honolulu, big, happy grin on this kid's face. I wanted the, this picture because guess what had just happened? I came out on deck and there were boats sailing alongside of us, little ones. And I looked over them and I saw land. It was Japan, a foreign country. I mean, you can tell somebody all their lives that there are places out there. But when you actually see them, you feel differently. I did. I thought, holy mackerel, there really are people here living out here on the other side of the world. I'm, I'm, I'm part of the, a wider community. I felt different. And I asked the passenger going by if she would take my picture, and she did. 
The other thing I had just found out was when the ship was in port, there's no reserved seats in the dining room because people are going on tours. You, can't, you have to be able to come and go as you please in order to accommodate that. So I thought almost immediately, hmm, I wonder if someone like me would have the nerve to just walk into the dining room. Th this is the tourist class dining room. I walked past the head waiter who knew everyone in tourist class who ate in there, and everybody ate in there, right? He didn't know me. I walked right past him like I owned the whole bloody ship, and I walked down this, wall, this row, went to the, almost the last table and sat down, very nervous, very self-conscious, but playing poker. I belong here. And the steward came up who took care of that table, and guess what? It was Ralph. I mean, what are the chances? The kid that I listen to rock and roll music on his record player, he's the steward for that table. And so we started a conversation. He said, oh, good on you, mate. I thought you were a first class passenger, but you're a tourist. And I go, yeah. He said, so you snuck out a tourist into first class and then from first class up on the forecastle? Yep. Good on you, mate. I mean, these were rebellious kids that were working for P&O lines, right? And they admired it. And I, I could feel the admiration coming from him like, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm kind of bad, yeah. <laughs> anyway, he made sure I ate every time we were in port. And I usually got at least one meal, breakfast, sometimes breakfast and lunch, or maybe breakfast and dinner. Oh, and for those of you that are concerned about having a hoodlum and a criminal being invited to this meeting today, I kept track of every uh, ounce of food that I, t that I ate while I was on board, and years later I sent P&O the money. Made me feel good, too. <laughs> This is Japan, this is Yokohama, Japan. This is the day we left. Um, people would throw these streamers across from the pier and from the ship to the pier. And then when the ship pulled away, they would part and it was a kind of a nice thing. We went from Yokohama to Kobe, Japan, and then from Kobe to Nagasaki. We were the first ship, what we heard, we were the first ship since the atom, atom, atomic bomb fell on Nagasaki. 21 years earlier to visit that port. As we were leaving Nagasaki, Ralph said when I was in there getting my last meal, um, things might be a little slow in here today. I said, oh, why is that? He said, well, one of the stewards got kicked out of the dining saloon for coming back to the ship drunk. Oh. And then he says, this is not going to be easy duty for Malcolm. And I said, Malcolm, is that the steward's name? Yeah. OK. That was supposed to be my meal ticket when we were at sea, right? So as we leaving Nagasaki, I found Malcolm. And he said, yeah, sorry, mate. How are you going to eat? I says, I don't know, three days to Hong Kong until the dining room opens for me. I'll figure something out. And I just want to tell you something that happened that was really marvelous in my opinion. As we were coming out of the Nagasaki Channel, there was a shipping company on the, on the right-hand side as we were going out to sea, and they were building a ship there. And all along the side of the ship, there was scaffolding, you know, where the workers could work on the ship. And as we pulled up alongside this shipping company, the, the, the ship's horn or whistle started blasting over and over again. And the workers took off their hard hats. They were all silver, shiny. Took off their hard hats and started waving them to the ship. 
And uh, it really touched me that these people had bounced back after an atomic bomb, and they were, they were waving to our ship, this passenger liner that was leaving the country. And I thought to myself, well, you know what? Three days without food is nothing compared to what these folks have been through. And so I started scrounging. I started looking for food any way I could. And um, I did find a few interesting things, like sometimes the stewards would leave, would leave food in trays outside people's rooms. And so I would uh, check the passageway and take maybe a half a slice of toast from one, play, one person, and maybe a glass of orange juice from another, and maybe a package of crackers from another, and then take it down to a restroom, and that's what I was eating. Plus, I had a beer for 15 cents, and there were hors d'oeuvres that they gave you a little, little plate of peanuts, which was, which was good. There were a lot of little children, too. There were a bunch of teenagers that were on kind of a tour together, and there were a bunch of little children. And uh, I don't know if you can see the, the young lady on the left, but you see there's a, a, a string around her, her um, shirt? Well, it's attached to a key. And the parents had the, the smaller children keep their room keys around their neck so they didn't misplace them. These two girls, Katie and Martha, 10 and 7. They've, I'd be sitting out reading a book, and those two little girls would always come up to me, and they'd go, what are you reading now? Oh, I'm reading this story about um, Tom Sawyer. Oh, we've heard about Tom Sawyer, you know? And then they'd sit down, and they'd t ask me to tell them what it was about. Then the next thing would happen, we'd start doing silly little games like, where do you think that person's from? Oh, I don't know, and making up these outrageous stories. So we became very kind of close, <laughs> closely bonded. And I noticed that Martha had a key around her neck. And so one day, we were in the ballroom, and I was doing some exercises because I was trying to stay in shape, and those little girls wanted to do exercises too. And when they did, Martha's key hung down around her neck. And I said, well, why don't, I mean, Katie's, no, Martha. I said, well, why don't, why don't you put that on the table here? And then when they left, she forgot it. And then I stuffed it in my shoe. So I had a key. Now, it's not that I wanted to go in their room. They were sharing a room with their parents. It's that I wanted to have the key with the blue tag on it that said it was a tourist class key so that in case somebody was looking at me funny or strange, I could always just reach in my pocket and pull out my key like I was looking for something else, and they would say, oh yeah, he's got a blue tourist class key. He belongs here, right? But I felt really guilty about this, and I've got, I've got copies of my book in the back if you want to read, if you want to get one. Uh, you'll see how I felt. I didn't feel good about myself. I felt kind of creepy, actually. But it was survival at that point, and I needed the key. Some beautiful sea, uh, scenery out at sea. This is just one sunset I, I happened to have that I took. The camera I had wasn't that good, but at least I got some pictures. And eventually we came to Hong Kong. And here's a couple of boats tied up to Iberia's side. At the, I remember they were offloading um, oranges, California oranges, for, um, to these boats. And these boats went, then would take them either to Kowloon, where we were moored, or across the water to Hong Kong. There were people that actually lived on these boats. I, I, I count uh, uh, an adult at the top and one, two, three, maybe four children in that picture. They were hungry. They looked up at me and went like this. And I said, you, you're hungry? And I was starving, right? And I remember going into that, that dining saloon and grabbing some oranges and apples right under the eyes of the, of the, of the uh, head waiter and not even paying attention to him and just going back out and then start delivering these to people out on the water. 
throwing an apple here, an orange here, and you should have seen it. it was fantastic. It was fun to watch these kids going, ah, yeah, thank you, thank you, you know, all that. It was just great. And while I'm doing that, I notice there's somebody standing next to me on the railing, and I look over, and it's the head waiter from tourist class. And he looks over the side, and then he looks at me, and then I look at him, and I go, this is it, Rick, you just gave yourself away. And then he nodded, and then he turned and walked back inside. Why, why didn't he say something to me? At least, why are you giving away company food? But wor at worst, how come I don't recognize you? I only see you coming in every once in a while. Don't you eat? But he never said anything. He just looked at me, kind of nodded, and left. I figured out a way to get off the ship. Later, if we have time, I'll tell you some of the ways that I did that with no passport, no landing pass, no driver's license, nothing. Um, and I took the ferry. Has anybody here ever been to Hong Kong? Yeah. So, you know... It's a busy waterway, and they got the ferries going back and forth, and I got on a ferry, and I, when I got over on to the Hong Kong, to the island of Hong Kong, there was a whole line of rickshaw drivers. And I saw this guy, and I thought, oh, that's a photograph. I got to get a picture. So I asked him if I could take his picture. He said yes, and I took his picture, and I started to walk away, and he said $4. Now, I didn't know it at the time, but he was talking four Hong Kong dollars, which was not much. I don't know, maybe 30, 40 cents, I don't know. But I thought he meant four US dollars. And at this point, I probably had, when I got on Iberia, I had $66. By now, this is like two weeks later, I probably have 40. Plus I had to buy the camera, which was probably around eight bucks or 10 bucks back then. So I didn't have a lot of money and I couldn't give him four bucks. And as I started to turn away, he started swearing at me, calling me all kinds of names. They, they have a tendency to call people from Britain Johnny McGregor. They go, you pay four dollar Johnny McGregor. Johnny McGregor. And then pretty soon his friends started doing the same thing till they were making a big ruckus. And I was embarrassed. So I took off and left and I felt weird like, those guys, those guys are serious. When around the corner, I was on my way to the tramway that goes up to the top of Victoria Peak so I could look down and see, and see the ships. And on my way, all of a sudden, I feel this rough hand on my shoulder turn me around, roughly. And I had this Instamatic camera that was hanging from a lanyard on my left arm as I was walking. And as I got turned around, I swung that camera around and I struck this guy on the side of the neck, right about here, and he went down on the pavement. And then I looked, and there were three other guys with him, Asian men. So I didn't know what to do. I just prepared to defend myself, and then four other people came around the corner, and they started running towards us, and then I took off, really, really afraid. Now I got seven people after me, but I get down the street a little bit, and I hear somebody say, Rick, Rick, it is I, Hassan, Hassan. And I go, Hassan, I only know one Hassan, one of the deck crew that I'd met when they were putting out the deck chairs in the morning, him and his partners. They were on liberty. They recognized what was going on. They ran up. Those Asian guys took off, and they basically saved me from getting accosted. And they, they escorted me to the tramway and made sure I got on it, and then they went back to the ship. And then I went up onto, onto the top of the tram, up to the top of Victoria Peak. And then this is one of the pictures I took. This is just like one-tenth the size of Hong Kong Harbor. It was really amazing. I went back finally went back to the ship. Turns out they were just put bringing the, the lines in. There was a typhoon coming and we had to go to sea. And most of the crew was still on the shore. So we went out through the harbor and with maybe um, a third of the crew on board because you can't ha stay in port when there's a typhoon. It'll destroy the piers. 
because of the wave action. And so went out, rode through a typhoon, my first ever, it was unbelievable, and then turned around and came back eventually. And picked up our Hong Kong passengers and headed for um, Singapore. This is a view from the, um, uh, in tourist class. This is the railing of the swimming pool for uh, back in tourist class. I don't know if you can see, can you see two red hats up here? And maybe two, two people? Those are the, those are the Goanese deckhand, a couple, that's what they look like, more in blue with the red hats. And then I noticed this just the other day. Do you see this white wall right there? It goes up against the, the railing. See the railing goes and it dead ends right there? Well, right around that corner is where the, the door was that was locked. So you see how you'd have to step out around the railing to get around that wall? That's what I got quite good at after a while. No fear after a while, but that first day, lots of fear. Lots of fear. The day after Hong Kong, I was standing near this railing, and this beautiful girl came up to me and introduced herself, Patsy Jones. She was traveling with her family to England. Her father was the chief of police in Hong Kong. And he'd just retired. And now he was moving to England to live with his family. Here's a group of a bunch of kids on the back of, of um, by the pool in tourist class. Oops, sorry. <laughs> yeah, did you see that? This is Patsy Jones. This is her brother Rob with the big hat on. This guy is one of the ship's officers. He snuck down there during lunchtime to hang out with these kids. The CAD. And then several other of the kids from tourist class that I got to meet while I was there. By the way, in this photograph, there is a stowaway. Can you pick him out? Which one is he? Is he this guy? Is he this guy? You sure? Could he be that guy? Yes. <laughs> Could he be this girl? <laughs> now you're right, that's him with the dark, borrowed sunglasses and wearing his Bermuda shorts. And the, you saw the next slide, but I'll put it on anyway. This is what I felt like most of the time. <laughs> you know, it's like hiding in plain sight, right? You're just hiding in plain sight, hoping you, you look like you belong. I wanted to show you this. Um, any soccer fans here? Anybody like soccer? A couple of folks, okay. You know what the World Cup is, right? It only happens once every four years. The night we got to Singapore, England, this is an English ship, England was playing Germany, 1966. It's the last time England was in the final, if I'm not mistaken. I know it's the last time they won it. They won it, and they put the, the game over the ship's public address system, and I was in this room with all these Brits cheering like crazy, and then the captain came on over the public address system, and he said, in honor of England's victory, the bars are open for an hour, no charge. Let me tell you what an interesting evening that became. <laughs> and the stewards were so happy. They were bringing mugs of ale to the tables, and then they were getting paid as tips because they weren't paying the bar for, the, for the booth. It was great. But I wanted to point that out because of the captain. Everybody said the captain was great. They, let's cheer, the, let's toast to the captain. <laughs> there would be multiple toasts, right? Well, speaking of the captain, that's him, Maurice Trenfield. We're almost to India. I'm standing on the stern looking at the wake, as I often did. It was very meditative for me to watch the, sh the waves go back, the wake disappear over the horizon. And I noticed there was someone standing next to me. And I turned, and I saw this. 
and my heart rate immediately started going away. Bam, 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 bam. And I looked at him, he looked at me and he said, good evening, sir. I said, good evening, Captain. He says, are you enjoying your, your cruise? Yes, sir, very much, sir. He says, glad to hear that. I hope that if you ever travel by sea again, you'll consider P&O lines. Yes, sir, there's no shipping company I like better. And he smiled and nodded and walked away, and I thought, no one will ever believe this. Eventually, we, got, uh, we, we went to um, Bombay, uh, Mumbai now, and uh, we were only there for like a half a day, and then we steamed across uh, towards Ara the Arabian Peninsula. This is Aden, South Arabia. We finally got, we tied up at that refueling barge there, got our fuel, and then headed north up the Red Sea till we got to Suez where we got into a long convoy and um, to go through the Suez Canal. And uh, while we were going through the Red Sea, I, did, I neglected to tell you this, but I'll tell you right now. David McLean had, ag had agreed that if he got any letters from California with a California re return address, he'd know they were for me. For me. And then when I, I wrote home to my folks, I wrote Dick in Hawaii, I wrote my buddy Stephen back in Reseda, which is where I lived, and I wrote my folks, and I told them, if you have anything, if you want to communicate with me, send it to David McLean, care of the next port that it will be in, and you can check with the P&O agent in Los Angeles to find out where Iberia will be and what days. And when we were going through the Red Sea, Malcolm shows up, pulls four letters out of his back pocket. They were all addressed to David McLean from California. Whoa, this should be interesting. One of them was from Dick Weishart back in Hawaii. He told me that Jamie had taken my, used my ticket and gotten home. He took my bags and everything, and that my folks had called there. And he told them not to worry that I had plenty of friends on board. Thank you, Dick. <laughs> Next one was from my best friend, Stephen Anaya, whose aunt and uncle live in England. He said, I've told them you're coming, and they're looking forward to it. <laughs> Great. Next one was from um, oh, my mom, who said, um, we're, uh, we're praying for you, honey. We know you're going to be OK. We pray that you'll be okay. You just keep being a good boy and everything's going to be okay. We're going to get you home. Don't you worry. All that like that, right? But her handwriting was a little bit shaky. I could tell she was lying. Well, I mean, she was trying to make me feel good. And the last one was from my father. And it surprised me incredibly because he didn't say anything like, what in the heck are you doing, you know? He, he just said, you're the talk of the town. Your buddies keep coming over. They've heard about it. They want to know what's going on. They keep asking, where am I, and all that. And then he said at the end, I know you're going to make it home safely. We're all pulling for you, Dad. Boy, did that lift my spirits, right? Which is what they wanted to have happen, I'm sure. But anyway, it was really, it was really wonderful. So we get through, we go through the Suez Canal. This was a monumental um, that I saw in the canal. We went through the canal, we got to, oops, that's too far. We got to Port Said, um, uh, Egypt, and then we started across the Mediterranean Sea. Now, one quick thing I wanna tell you as we were going across the Med, um, Patsy Jones, had already confronted me about not living down in tourist class. And I told her, well, I lived in, I was really from first class because I had that key in my pocket. I kept the red key in the right pocket and the blue key in the other pocket. So I reached in, I didn't have a chance to check, and I just said, well, does this tell you anything, Patsy? And she went, oh my gosh, you are first class. I go, yep. But then, I'm, I'm, in a, I'm in the cinema watching a movie, 
And I noticed that somebody sits down next to me and I look over and it's Patsy and I said, hi, hi. And then she sticks her mouth over next to my ear and says, is your name really Rick Fry or Rick West? That's the name that I was going by, West. And I said, well, some people call me Richard. She goes, no, I mean, is it really West? And I go, yeah, why do you ask? She said, because I know there's an R West on the tourist class passenger list, but I've already been down there and I know that's not you, that's someone else. So I said, so what do you think? And she said, well, I went up to the first class passenger list. I was so scared to go to first class, but I went through, I went up there and I, and I looked through, I went through the bureau right in front of the officers and everything. And I looked at the passenger list and there was no Rick West on the passenger list. And I said, no, Rick West is the name I use when I'm in tourist class. Oh, well, what name did you see on B75, which was the red key? And she said, well, it certainly wasn't Rick. And I said, well, would you believe me if I told you it was Greg Thompson? And she said, no, I don't think so. You answer to Rick too easily. I said, okay. Can you keep a secret? And so I leaned over and whispered in her ear, I'm a stowaway. And then I just looked at, at the screen and I could see her eyes like on me. Like, and then she said, really? And I just nodded and she goes, what do you eat? And I looked at her and I said, not much. And she said, oh, Ricky, or whatever your name is, come on. She grabbed my hand and we left. We can see this movie some other time. And then I told this girl the whole thing. Took a chance, what could I do? She was too smart. And she was the only one the whole summer that figured it out. So we go, we get to, uh, we're going across the Mediterranean when this happened. So the next slide is Barcelona. And I got another letter and this is from my mother and it was an $80 international money order that Jamie had left the money and she'd gotten a money order and sent it to Barcelona. But I didn't have any identification. So I got this idea, Patsy and I, we walked through Barcelona looking for an overseas telephone exchange. I was gonna call my mom and ask her if she'd send my driver's license to the Barlows in England, right? But we never could find a, a phone exchange. Are we okay for Todd? I wanted you to see this girl on the right. Her name is Sandy Weiss. Sandy's from Portland, Oregon. Sandy told me she was gonna be going home via ship. And later, you're gonna find out why that could be important. Uh, these were other kids that were from tourist class. Brooke, Kathy, Timmy, and Sandy. And this is just as we were coming into Lisbon. This is uh, the Lisbon Harbor. Anybody been there? Yeah. Um, I just wanted to see this. Because I found this fascinating. Look at that bridge. What does it look like? You know why it looks like the Golden Gate? Same architect. Same engineer. Yeah, I think it's the exact same bridge. Who, who knew? Who knew? Anyway, that's, uh, that's coming into Lisbon. And then, two days later, Southampton, England. Ship's final destination. This is the very pier where we tied up. The ship looked like this when she was tied up. Since this was the last destination, there was no messing about with boarding passes or anything. We got in about 10 o'clock at night. Next morning at 8 a.m., Customs and immigration were coming to tear that ship apart and clear every single person that was on it. So I tried to, they let the crew off. I tried to go off with the crew and got about halfway down the gangway and then somebody, the, one of the officers said, hey, sir, yeah, this is just for crew. Oh, I just want to take a picture. Sorry, I can't let you off. So I'm back. I went back to the stern and checked that gangway, same thing. There were ropes in the back, 
that were quite close to the to the pier, not not so high as these bow these bow lines. Uh, but there was strong light on the stern of the ship. So I decided I was going to try to shimmy down those, one of those big lines. Wait till it was, everybody was asleep. It was pitch black up on the, up on the forecastle, And I was going to try it, and I figured, well, even if I slipped, it's maybe 60 feet. As long as I land on, with my feet first, I should be okay. But I didn't like the idea. It was very scary. And so about 2.30, I was up there getting ready to do this, and all of a sudden, light came on the forecastle, bright light. And it turns out that that was the dock lights. The, sh the stevedores and longshoremen were coming um, aboard to clear the luggage and the baggage. And they started doing it around 3 a.m. And so there, there I was. I couldn't go off the stern lines. I couldn't go off the bow, the bow lines. I couldn't get off the gangway. That left one direction. What direction? <laughs> the water direction, <laughs> right? Oops. See this spot right here? That's as close to the water as you can get in sea deck, on sea deck. So at five minutes after three in the morning, I wrapped up my camera in a big plastic bag. I tucked my jeans inside my socks. I buttoned up my shirts all the way to the top. I rolled my sleeves up on my sweater as high as I could get them. I stepped over the railing and I stepped out into the dark and fell feet first down into Southampton's water. Sw swam up next to the hull, looked up at the hull first, at the, up at the, sh sh the railing, and there w it, they were bare. It was great. No, nobody heard anything. Swam in under the curvature of the hull, so now you couldn't see anybody down below you. Started treading water back towards the stern of the ship around this way, around the back. My idea was to go uh, right around the rudder, get over to the pier, and then, I don't know if you noticed that, see that tire? See that tire right there? That's on the end of the pier? Well, the hull of the ship was right about here, and I figured what I'd do is I'd just swim from here right over to here, and then come back down to this tire, and then figure out a way, hopefully there'd be a ladder here somewhere. But when I got to the stern of the ship, I could hear voices there. And I, I pulled out from the hull a little bit and looked up, and there were two guys having a cigarette on the stern of Sea Deck right above the water, right, above, right in the center. And I was afraid that they might hear me below or see me in the water. The, 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 the light from the ship went up, went like this, about out like this. So what I, what I did was I swam out away from the ship, out this way, outside the light, and then turned to come around in the dark side of the pier. But when I turned to come around, instead of being here, I was over here. <laughs> what was going on? I mean, there was shock because I, I, I turned to look for the ship and the ship's go moving away from me. What, what's the answer to that? What? Tide. tide. Ebb tide. And even a one knot ebb tide will have you a quarter of a mile away in 15 minutes. And this tide was going, was ebbing this way. It was coming, it was coming down alongside the pier going from right to left. And while I w had my back to the ship, kicking this way, it was doing this to me as I was kicking out. So I ended up, I figured about 200 feet away from the ship. So what, what, would, what do you think a, a person would do when they realize they're going the wrong direction? Start swimming towards the ship, right? So I started swimming, swimming hard. 
swimming as hard as I could swim. And finally, I was exhausted and I hadn't made any progress whatsoever. And so I bo was bobbing along with the tide and I could hardly breathe. And I'm gonna drown when I remember Barry Devine's drown proofing lesson. Remember what I told you about that? This is what that lesson was designed for. You're fully clothed, no flotation device, and you're panicked. I had nothing I could do except trust Barry Divine. And so I started drown proofing, and slowly but surely I got my breath back. I got my composure back. I realized I probably was still getting pushed out towards the English Channel, but at least I wasn't going to drown. I could float. I could do this all night if I had to. And it gave me time. I knew there weren't going to be any rescuers, so I started thinking about how did I get in this dilemma? And what I remembered was, or, or realized was, is that when I had first jumped off and I was right here alongside the ship, there was no tidal action whatsoever. It was perfectly calm there. I needed to get back out of the current, head back to get the ship and the pier between me and where that current was coming from. And so once I knew that, then I did drown proofing and some side stroking. Drown proofing and some side stroking until I got it, I could feel the current give me up. Then, with all the energy that I had left, which wasn't much, I finally went right back to the side of the ship, went right through that light, got to that tire, and held onto those treads, and just could finally relax. I didn't have to keep treading water. And I must have laid there for 15, 20 minutes, cramping. My calves were cramping up, and I had to keep pulling my toes away from or towards my knee to try to stretch my calf muscle. But eventually, I got out. There was a ladder near the end of the pier, climbed out, found a, a train car, spent the night in a gondola, which is like a box car with no roof on it. Then in the morning, got out. Oh, and then meanwhile, I'm, I'm soaked to death and I'm freezing, right? And I got no way to dry off. And, and I took, took all my clothes off and tried to swing them, wring them out, swing them around. But, you know, it's like 4 o'clock in the morning now, at the coldest time of the night. And there's no way I'm going to get any, any dry clothes. And I'm starting to freeze and my hair's wet everything. And I see the plastic bag that the camera, I'd carried the camera in. And it was a big one. And I took the camera out, and I poked a hole in the bottom of the bag, and I sat in the corner of that gondola, and I pulled that bag over my body, and I pulled my feet up next to my bottom and got my knees inside of it. And I, after a minute or two, shaking, I could actually, when I'd lift my chin, I could feel warmth coming out of the bag. And I thought, you're going to make it. Ricky, you're going to survive to sunrise. Although my feet were just frozen. They weren't in the bag. Got out, got redressed in wet clothes, got past the, the dockyard gates, made it to, to the town of Southampton, hitchhiked up to Oxford, no identification, $80 money order in another plastic bag in my pants. I walk into the bank at Oxford near the university walk in, hand the, the, the teller the money order. She said, sign it, please. I signed it, gave it to her. She went and took it to manager in the back. She brought it back, pulled out 30 pounds of British money and handed it to me. Thank you, sir. All that worry about not having an ID, you don't need an ID with an international money order. At least you didn't in that bank. Found a laundromat met the kids in, in the, that worked in the laundromat and the nice old lady there that they wanted to hear the whole story why I was so wet. I told them while the, she was drying my clothes and washing my clothes. The, the Bobby came in, the town Bobby, and I shut up and she said, go on, Rick. Our Bob won't turn you in. He wants to hear the story too. And so he sat in the, in the laundromat with, and listened to the whole thing and everybody thought it was marvelous, right? 
I told them I was trying to get to Bolton. They said, no, go back to London. Take a, take a coach up there. It's too far to hitchhike and all that. So I went back to London. This is me with, with dry clothes on. I think I even combed my hair. I got a BOAC bag that I was able to buy with my new money. I got peanut butter and honey and bread and a pint of milk. And this lady was walking by the alley. With the, there's her purse and her book. And she said, well, you're the happiest looking bloke I've seen all day. And she took my picture. And I said, Heck, I am happy. I, I'm alive. Anyway, two days later, Ken and Irene Barlow and their daughter, Lindsay. And two days after that, oh, and you should have seen the expression on their face. My friend Stephen had told him I was coming, but he didn't tell him how I was coming. So they wanted to know where my suitcases were. <laughs> You're looking at it, gang. Wait, 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 what do you mean? And then I told him, oh my goodness, what? Two days later, their daughter was getting married. They got me a suit and everything, and I went to the, the wedding. The reception was better. It was a great reception. And then, meanwhile, I had given, I had given Patsy uh, some rolls of film from my little Instamatic camera, figuring if I drowned, at least somebody would have evidence of the trip, and, or if I was in jail. And uh, I had the address that the parents had purchased this little cottage down in Canterbury, and so two days later, I hitchhiked down to see Patsy. And there she is, the lovely Patsy Jones. This is in her backyard. It had just rained and she was out cutting some flowers. And meanwhile, she told her parents and her brother and sister. So when I showed up, they went, you, unbelievable, marvelous, un incredible, terrific. And then her mother said, bloody cheeky. If you she, did, she wasn't too impressed. She just thought it was cheeky. This is her brother Rob on the left. That's her dad, the retired police chief in the middle. And that guy on the right that looks like Errol Flynn, that is Uncle Frank. That's her dad's uncle. He's a sea captain. He came down that day in a cab from London to see them because he was leaving in the morning on a ship and he wanted to see his first round-eyed stowaway. And we had a marvelous time, Frank and I, talking about how I might be able to get back to the States. He said, you can get, maybe you can find an American freighter that's coming into Galveston or New York or wherever. And I said, wonderful idea. Well, when I woke up in the morning, Frank was gone to meet his ship but he left a note on the table, and it said, good luck, lad. P.S., if worse comes to worse, you can always stow away again. He said, you know how to do it. I had, I, so now, I'm, now it's Mission America. Now I gotta figure out a way to get home, but there's two things on my checklist. One, I've got to go surfing. And two, because I haven't been surfing all, all summer, right? I got to go surfing, and two, I want to see Stonehenge. So I hitchhiked to the coast and found a surf shot at a t little town called Newquay in Cornwall. And for five shillings, I was able to r rent a board, and I went out for an hour in that freezing cold water. But you know what? It was wonderful. It was just wonderful. Then I go out and hitchhike. I'm going to go to st Stonehenge, and these two fishermen pick me up and they think it's a wonderful idea to see Stonehenge. And they drive 100 miles out of, out of their way and camp. We camp in the field next to the monument, right next to the monument. I'm talking about we open up the tent flap and you can walk right up to it. Now, you can't do that now, I understand. I think it's closely guarded. They don't let anybody touch those stones. But I got it checked off. It was great. That, that night, I have made it back to Bolton. I told Ken and Irene uh, what Frank had told me, to see if you can find a ship. Glasgow looked like the best place to go. And Irene said, you know, if you're going to Glasgow, the Americans have an Air Force base up there in Ayrshire, not too far from Glasgow. Maybe the Yanks will give you a ride home. 
So I said, okay, I'm gonna go try that. So I hitchhiked up to, up to Edinburgh. They, they also said, if you're gonna go to Glasgow, you better go to Edinburgh, because they have a thing there called the tattoo. Have you ever heard of the Edinburgh tattoo? Right, it's all the bagpipers from the Highland military regiments. And they, you gotta see it, people come and, it's in the courtyard at Edinburgh Castle. You gotta go, if you're that close, people will be there from all over the world. So, here's Edinburgh Castle. Got a ride. The, the, if you get this book, I think you'll crack up listening to the ride in the truck that I got with the hitchhiking with this truck driver to get to, to, get to Edinburgh. It, 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 that is a hilarious part of the whole summer. I won't, I won't go into it, but he picked up every hitchhiker along the road, and you can just imagine. And so we had people in the cab, we had people in the back of the truck, and then it started hailing. And uh, it, I'll leave it at that, you can imagine. Um, while I was standing here, I noticed a big commercial jet landing. So I asked one of the guards that was um, at the castle, I said, is there an airline, is there an um, um, airport here? Is it international? Yeah. Yeah, there's, uh, planes go to Montreal and New York all the time. Now, 19 years old, young and dumb, thinking, hey, maybe I could figure out a way to get on an airplane. So I asked the guy, and he told me three things. One, if you're going to the tattoo, you need to have a bottle of whiskey. Okay, good advice. Two, there's a train, a, a night train that goes from Edinburgh to Glasgow, so you could be there in the early morning. And three, you could make it to the airport on bus and still get back in time for the show, the six o'clock show. So. I hustle down the hill, stop in a liquor store, buy a little pint of VAT 69 whiskey, put it in my bag so I have it, get the bus, get to the airport, get on an airplane, I mean actually on the airplane. Stewardess sees me come in and not hand over, not greet the other stewardess that was had her head in the cockpit, and then starts to, and I was just getting ready to sit down too. And then she comes up to me like, may I see your boarding pass, right? And I said, oh, I'm here looking for Mrs. Franklin. You, Mrs. Franklin, she goes, are you a passenger? No, no, I'm just, I've got a gift here for a going away present for Mrs. Franklin. And so she goes and she checks on the passenger list. There's no Mrs. Franklin on board. Oh, doggone it, all this way for nothing. And then I got back off. And th that's when you had stairs out on the tarmac. Ran back inside. It, it, the details are a little clearer when you see it, but what kind of a 19-year-old was thinking that he could pass customs and immigration when he got to New York, even if he stayed on the plane? How are you gonna get past that scrutiny? So it was, I was grateful that it didn't work. Did take the train, oh, saw the tattoo, it was wonderful, drank that whole bottle, along with another bottle that an, th these Canadians had. So I was feeling a little loopy, and took the train and got into Glasgow, was followed by a guy from the train station, turns out he was, he had a partner and they were lining me up, but I, I evaded them. Next morning, hitchhiked over to Prestwick Air Force Base, made my pitch, to the sergeant that was near the front gate. Um, he wanted to detain me, and so I extricated myself from that situation, got off the base, hitchhiked back the next morning. I get back to Bolton, Lancashire, where Ken and Irene live, and I say, that's it, you guys. There were no ships in Glasgow. Air Force is not interested. I tried the, an airplane, that didn't work. I'm gonna to have to give myself up. And Ken Barlow says, well, you know, Ricky, I was looking in the paper. In three days, the Queen Mary's leaving on her second to last voyage from Southampton. And then he said, you know how to do it, mate. And I went, oh, that's what Frank said, Uncle Frank said to me. You've done it before, you know how to do it. And I thought, all right, well, what's, what's, to be, what's to lose? I'll try it. 
So he gets me a ride down to, <laughs> down, Ken gets me a ride down to London with a truck driver. And um, then I hitchhiked to Southampton. I get there the night before. I look at the ship, but it's too dark to figure anything out. So the next morning, I'm down there bright and early, and I'm looking at her. She's sailing, I think, about 1 p.m., maybe noon. I'm right down on the pier. I thought that was a cool picture, so I took it. And then I'm walking along the pier, but you're not supposed to be down on the pier unless you're working there. But I looked like I belonged, right, until I started taking pictures. And so I walked back up on the observation deck that's a little higher, the next level up from this, and I'm looking and looking and looking, and it's 10 o'clock in the morning, and now it's 11 o'clock in the morning, and I'm trying to figure out an angle, and then I notice something for the first time that I hadn't seen for a couple of hours. There was a group of people that were allowed to go on the ship with no identification whatsoever. Can you imagine, who, what group of people would that be? Any ideas? Say, say something. Politicians. Politicians. <laughs> But I wouldn't have known they were politicians. There was something distinctive about them that told me what their career was. Entertainment, like taking on musical instruments, that's a good one. Yeah, but a, you, how would you know? In spe, they, one person said, for those of you that didn't hear, one, one person said politicians, one said musicians, one said inspectors. I'll, I'll get to it. Yes. Food delivery people, yeah, that, that, that could work too, except the food was being delivered down below decks. These people were going up the gangways. It was florist delivery boys. People taking flowers on board to passengers that were leaving, right? So now I think, okay, 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 I need a passenger. And there's a couple there, and their young son, I think it was, and they're shouting to somebody across from the observation platform over to the ship. And so I walk up to the man and I say, excuse me, sir, who is that um, woman that you folks are yelling to? Oh, that's my wife's sister, Edith. Is it Edith Jones? No, Edith Howell. I said, oh, okay. I thought she looked familiar, but uh, no, uh, she doesn't. Anyway, thank you. And then I turn and I'm thinking, Edith Howell, Edith Howell. Edith Howell, Edith Howell, Edith Howell. K keep it in your head, kid. Edith Howell, Edith Howell, Edith Howell. And I head back to Southampton, find a florist shop, Applebee's Floral Boutique, go in there, buy the cheapest set of daisies I could find, get some stationery and write, Richard, deliver these to Edith Howell. Queen Mary, right? Stuff it in my pocket, grab the flowers, pay the 15 pence or whatever it was, haul back to the ship, get back in line, heart rate going, get to the, get to the front, the, the, the quarter deck. Steward, officer. Steward says, name? I said, Edith Howell. He says, no, your name. Oh, Rick? Oh, shoot, they're gonna know my name. Um, West. Request, passenger, um, Edith Howell, Edith Howell, Edith Howell. Company, Appleby, very good. Takes a piece of paper, writes down Edith Howell's stateroom, or state, um, cabin, and he says, then the officer says, 10 minutes, Richard, we're about to shove off. Yes, sir, and I'm aboard. I'm on the Queen Mary. Oh my God, did I ever feel like a genius, right? And something doesn't feel right. What is it? What is it? This is not like Hawaii. Oh, they know whether the name is true or not, they know this guy's on board. I wonder if you have to check off when you leave. Yeah, do they? So I put
put these flowers on a table and I start looking for a florist delivery person and I find one, uh, one deck up. And I asked him, I said, hey, do they check you in and out off the ship? He goes, aye. I said, well, what would happen if you decided you just wanted to go to New York? And he said, well, they're not going to leave until every name's accounted for. And if they do leave and they find you on board, you're going to jail, mate. And I says, you've been doing this for very long? Yeah, a long time. It's not like he was new, right? And I said, okay, thanks. So I sat there for maybe 10 minutes. If he's wrong, I'm home. If he's right, I'm dead. What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? And I made the decision that it wasn't right. It wasn't going to work. And so I went and found Edith, Edith Howell's cabin and left the flowers, you know, at her door. And then I walked off. And boy, was I dejected. There she goes. This is her second to last voyage. After this voyage, she comes back to England one more time, and then where does she go? Long Beach, yeah. And this, now she's at a hotel convention center. So this is, their, this is their second to last voyage. And Ken told me that the USS United States was also in town. And it was supposed to be leaving then as well, maybe an hour later. So I thought maybe I could get over to the United States as pier, but I was so depressed and so sad. I just sort of sat there. In fact, I, I'm not ashamed to tell you, I was crying right here. I was actually, had my head down, tears were streaming down my face because after the whole summer of doing as well as I could, now at the very end here, I was gonna have to turn myself in. 20 minutes later, 20 minutes later, the SS United States went by. This was considered the most luxurious ship in the world at the time. And I was kind of kicking myself. Why didn't you go over there first? But no good. Okay, I'm going to go turn myself in at the embassy. Tomorrow I'll go, tomorrow I'll go up to London. I'll find the embassy. I'll tell them what I did. Might be kind of fun to see what they say. They're not going to believe me, but they're not going to, what else can they do? They're going to have to believe me. So I'm heading back to the downtown Southampton, and I see this girl struggling with a suitcase by herself. And I'm, first I think, well, I'll help her, but then I think, she, that reminds me of Sandy. Remember the girl that I showed you in, in Lisbon? Yeah. Sandy from Portland. Um, She's traveling alone. I wonder if she has trouble with suitcases. Hey, Sandy, she's in a hotel up in, up in London. And I had a list of the people. I knew that Kathy was up there. That was the other girl, and Sandy, and one of the other British guys that was living in Coventry. And so I thought, well, I'll go to a phone booth. And I called the hotel. I think it was the Edwards Hotel in London, and asked for Sandy Weiss. And it rang two times, and then she answered the phone. And I said, Sandy? She goes, yes. I said, it's Rick from Iberia. And she goes, oh, Rick. Oh, Rick. Pa Patsy called last week and told me about you. Oh, is it true? What's that? That you were a stowaway on Iberia? Yes, it was true. Oh my gosh, I want to hear the whole story, but I can't do it right now. I've got to leave. I've, there's a cab here, and I've got to go get in it. I'm heading to Southampton. And I said, you, what are you going to Southampton for? I'm leaving tomorrow on the Canberra. The Canberra? Yes, it's a P&O ship. Remember I told you I was going to be sailing back? Yes, but I didn't see the Canberra in the, in the paper. Well, I can't tell you about that, but she's leaving tomorrow. And I said, well, I'm in Southampton. And she said, oh, you are? Could you come and see me off? <laughs> Biggest understatement of my life. Why, yes, I would like to do that.
She says, K K Sam, um, Patsy told me that you were looking for a ship to work on. Maybe you could work on Canberra. No, they, they only take Br Br British nationals. Uh, well, um, how's it going? I said, well, I think I've got a pretty good lineup here, and I'll, I'll know more tomorrow or the day after. And she said, okay, will you come? Yes, so I met her. Here's a paint, this is a painting of the Canberra on the right. That ship in the background is the Iberia. It's by the same auth the same artist, um, F uh, Mr. Lloyd, who did the cover of the book, of my book, my book cover. Anyway, this is what she looks like. She's about two times as big as the Iberia. Same layout, same layout. Um, first class and, and tourist class, uh, two thirds first, about one third. Um, tourist class. Seven days later, doing the same thing, I made it to Port Everglades, Florida. Sandy, meanwhile, finds out that I was a stow. That she found out that I'd stowed away on this ship. She didn't know when she went to make a phone call. I said I'd see myself off, and then three days out in the middle of the Atlantic, I found her up in first class and said, "Could you help me out?" She was so shocked. She said, oh my God, you've done it again, haven't you? Yeah, but don't worry, you're not gonna get in trouble. You, you knew nothing about it. And she gave me $5, which was enough to buy beer and candy bars and potato chips. And the day before, we made this decision that uh, she would get a guest pass for a guy named Rick Fry that lived in Florida. And we used that and I just came off with her. We went to a payphone booth, called my folks. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that was an interesting conversation. They wanted the phone number and the phone number of the Western Union station and a phone number of the payphone. Called me back, said there's $150 waiting for you at Western Union. Sandy paid for the cab and we went over there. I got the $150, gave her back her $5 plus the cab fare said goodbye to her, got in the cab, got to the bus station, took the bus down to Miami International Airport, went to get a ticket to fly home, but I didn't have enough money because I'd paid for the airfare and the bus. The National Airlines ticket agent was so sweet, and she believed that I was a university student, and she gave me a half-price ticket, $75. So I was able to go home with about 30 bucks or 40 bucks, which really pleased my dad. Anyway, got to LA, got, on, got a bus, took the bus home and then hitchhiked the last three blocks and it was late September and I was finally home. Um, I don't know how much time we have, but I made a list of observations. If you'd like to go through them or we can just cut it off right there. About two minutes? Okay. Um, I'll just, then we can't go through all these observations. I'll do uh, the first one and maybe the last one. I, but the first one's the most important one. The environment is neutral. Attitude determines your fate. And it's not what hand you're dealt, but how you play it that determines whether you're going to be okay. And I have a whole bunch of other ones in there. They're in the, they're in the book. Um, let's, let's leave it at that, and if, you do, and if you have some questions, we can answer them, okay? Questions? Okay, JJ. Um, while I'm walking down there, I have a question, be thinking about it when, I, <clears throat> when it's my turn to ask a question. And yes, that sir. is, <clears throat> your parents obviously imbued within you a self-confidence, so let's talk about that. Do you have any children? I do, three, three boys. Did you ever encourage them to do something like this? Would what? Did you ever encourage them to do something like this? Can you all hear the question? Um, I'll tell you what I encourage them to do. Um, I encourage them to follow their dreams. Um, one, of the, one of the observations from that summer that um, you, can't, you won't see is that... Um, Why don't you go ahead and click on it just so they can see it? 
Well, it's not the whole, they come on one at a time, so. Well, it, do some quick clicking. Okay, quick click clicking. Can you just read them, want me to read them? Should I read them fast? Sure. Concentrate on what you can control, everything else is not worth the worry. Learn to drown proof. <laughs> there are not gonna be any rescuers, figure out how you got into the trouble to get out of it. You can learn something from a cockroach. Um, see, I w didn't have time to t explain that to you, but one night I woke up with a cockroach on my arm. I was sleeping next to one of the bathing compartments. The, this was a little room with a bathtub in it. And I woke up and I, was, and I shook it off. I was disgusted and I was gonna kill it. And it scurried underneath the tub and I could look at it back there in the shadows with its antennas moving around. And the more I looked at it, the more I realized that we were identical. We, we were both getting a free ride, but we had to look for our food. <laughs> and we had to sleep in the weirdest damn places. So anyway. Sometimes you just need luck. I mean, there's no doubt about it. That's for sure. You can live, live cheaper than you think. Um, believe you're something you want to be and others will believe you are too, right? See the big picture but observe the details. If you're really tired, you can sleep almost anywhere. Travel is best when it helps you see your wider community. Take an interest in the other guy's story. You may gain a friend and you will definitely learn something. Reading is a great cover for sleeping in public. Any port is okay in a storm, but no port is okay in a typhoon. Exercise when you're depressed and when you're not. You remember, remember the sports deck, that big deck? I used to go up there and jog around it at night. And I tell you what, I think when I was in the water in Southampton, I was in that water for over 45 minutes. I think part of it was because my aerobic benefit, my aerobics um, conditioning was, was strong enough to keep me going. Make friends with kids, the elderly, and everybody in between. <laughs> Survival can blur ethical boundaries. I, I didn't like lying to people. I didn't like it at all. But it was like, I'll make it up to them some other time. Looking before you leap is not good enough. Think also about tidal action. Predators often hang out in train stations. That's from the Glasgow situation. That was one of the most fearful things on the trip, what happened then, which we didn't get, have time to explain. Fatigue magnifies problems. Rest puts them in perspective. While on the move, look behind you regularly. For, you know, for one thing, it'll remind you how to get back. If you look at, for landmarks when you're, if you're just looking at landmarks when you're going north, when you turn around to go south, you won't recognize any landmarks. So every once in a while, look back and see, well, what are the landmarks coming out of here? Take plenty of pictures. Learn to forgive yourself. I learned that. Okay, it's okay. You can lie right now. I forgive you. This is the one to answer your question, ma'am, about what, do you ever encourage your children to do anything? And I th immediately thought of this. It's unwise to tell your children their dreams are impossible because they're liable to just say, okay, then I'm doing it, right? But if you kind of encourage them, just have dreams that are reasonable and we'll support you. Even if they're kind of unreasonable, we'll support you. You can keep going long after you think you can't. You probably learn more from failures than successes. Trust your instincts. That'll be explained more in the book. Consider the worst might happen, but live like it won't. Don't give up unless there are no other options. Receptions are usually better than weddings. You're right about that. <laughs> 
Ships are aquatic time machines, particularly if you're going across um, time zones, and really if you're going across date lines. I mean, I went to sleep on a Sunday night, and I woke up on Tuesday morning. I went, what is going on here? A few well-placed lines can hold a giant ship steady, yep. The open sea is far more interesting than most coastlines. I've learned, I learned to appreciate the open sea. You can survive for days on beer and Cadbury fruit and nut bars. My favorite candy bar to this date. Have you ever had one? Yeah. Yummy. Plain sight is often a suitable hiding place. An appearance of serenity can camouflage internal anxiety. Are you sure you're not a psychologist? I, I have studied psychology. Be tolerant, but not of bullies or the rude. If you get the book, you'll see what that's about. Accept the generosity of others and pass it on. You'll see what that's about, too. Keep in touch with those you care about. And that's the first one. The, ad the environment is neutral. Attitude determines your fate. Questions, comments, protests? I think you ought to be giving some parenting classes. <laughs> I don't know any parents that would trust me with their kids. Well, obviously you're, uh, okay, you have a sense of humor, so that means you're a man of high intelligence. Oh, thank um, you. And secondly, um, like I wanted to get on the train, I was too afraid. You had confidence to do this. Well, you know what, uh, Tom, uh, um, in the book, it describes that, that like 30 minutes before the ship sailed. And I had long conversations with myself back and forth asking a couple of questions like, if I do this, will my parents ever forgive me? Yeah, they will eventually forgive me, right? They're my parents. If you don't do this, will you forgive yourself, Rick? No, I'm going to feel awful my whole life if I don't do it. At least I was telling myself that. So there, were, there was a lot of give and take before I, got, before I finally said, done, I'm doing it. Well, could this be done today? No. That answers that question. Not, not, not like this, not where you can just walk up the gangway or you can smile at the, at the guy on the, on the gate. Because of 9-11, we're not letting people smile past us anymore. Back in those days, not everybody that looked like they belonged had a, had a vest tied to their chest. They just were kids that were out having fun and trying to figure stuff out. Heck, I remember when we were little, we walked into the, the walk-in movie theater backwards to see if they'd think we were leaving. <laughs> Just to see if we could do it. And then, of course, when we found out we could, then all kinds of things started happening. Like, whoa, well, we can buy more popcorn because we don't have to pay the 25 cents to, to, to get in. So they're still going to get the money. We're always rationalizing how we did this, you know. But no, I don't think so. So back to your parents. Yep. They obviously encouraged you to follow your dreams. They, um, they had five other kids. And they spent a lot of time just taking care of us having food on the table. There wasn't a whole lot of, you're gonna, you, you need to do this to set yourself up to be able to do this to go forward and forward. They did push college. They said, you've got, after high school, you've got to go to college. They pushed that. If they hadn't pushed it, I wouldn't have gone. But I'm glad I did. And I'm glad I went on beyond that. You have a question? I heard, it's like the auction house. You move your arm and you get a question. Questions? Comments? The books are available in the back. You get a custom signature, get your picture taken with the author. Rick Frey, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you.